ask to join the other team to bring us the word this morning. Bless you. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello. There we go. Hey, how good is communion? Man, where are you, Mary? Oh, that was very Holy Spirit. That was wonderful. Okay, uh, most of this message is kind of just going to be loud. Uh, most of it's just going to be a, a testimony, so it's not going to really be your normal sermat format. Sermon format. Did I say sermat? Sermat. Sermon format. Um, that's all right. But before I share my testimony, I have another testimony. On Friday night, uh, we had youth group. And actually, let's go back two Friday nights. Two Friday nights ago when Pastor Steve and Helen were here. Uh, Steve shared and some of the youth received Christ. And that was really, really cool. So that's, that's the greatest miracle. And that's really the greatest part of this story. It's, it's always really good when you see kids come to Christ. And then the next week, so last Friday night, one of the girls who was the sister of one of the girls that received Christ, so, uh, so the sister, uh, she was talking to me, and, and she said she got diagnosed with a bone disease earlier in the year. She couldn't remember the name of it because it was big and complicated, and I said, so what does that mean for you? And she said, well, it, obviously it has an effect on my bones, but she said it also affects my organs, and it sort of gives me the potential to develop different kinds of cancers you know, when I grow up. And I'm like, you're like 15. You shouldn't have to worry about this stuff. And... Um, so I shared a couple of short stories of healing with her, and then I said, look, we're going to pray for you at the end of the night. Don't leave until we pray for you. And, and uh, at the end of the night, uh, I pointed to her. I said, you come with me. I pointed to her best friend. I said, you come with me. I also pointed to the first girl's sister who received Christ the week earlier. I'm like, and you come with me. And then I just saw two others, and I'm like, and you and you. You come with me. You know, just, let's all be a part of it. So we sat down the front just there and made a, a circle with the chairs. And... I really love these times because I don't need to pray for people. I can just get the youth to pray for each other and I just teach them how to do it. And then they realize, whoa, Jamie's not any more special than me. If I've got Jesus, then I've got authority and I can pray for people. You know, discipleship is more caught than taught. You can't teach people into discipleship necessarily. I mean, that's part of it. But when you get people to do things, that's where the real, come on, meat happens. And, and so I got the sister to lay hands on on her sister who was sick and, and I'm just talking them through and I'm talking about the nature of it and I'm like, and listen to the way I pray and, 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 and I, I did pray because you know, they, they hadn't really heard it before you know, in the name of Jesus, sickness, leave, etc, etc and, um, and I'm like, and ha don't take your hand off you know, how you're feeling and, and she, uh, you know, uh, what, what's going on in your body and, and she's like, well, I don't really know at this stage I said, is there anything coming out of your sister's hand? I mean, sometimes you can feel things happen around where they put their hand. Other times, you don't feel anything. Both are completely normal. And she's like, something is coming out of my sister's hand into my body. I was like, oh, that just means the Holy Spirit is working, and let's just keep the hand there for a while. And, you know, keep teaching them things. We prayed a couple more times. I'm like, get up and walk around, move you. It mostly hurt in her ribs. And so I was like, just move around and, and start bending over and stuff. To, you know, test it out. And she's like, the pain is down. Oh, my goodness. And then, you know, we prayed again, and, and then it was all gone. And... And it's always kind of nice when they're in pain at the moment because, you know, you can tell when, when it's changed straight away. And, uh, and so, and because a miracle has just occurred, all five kids have just seen this. Two of them have been a part of it. And, and you, you get to tell her the gospel. And, and Jesus died and he rose and this is what it means. And, and it, it, it's for you. Salvation is for you. And... And then I got to speak to the sister. I'm like, you know, you have the same authority that I do. I'm, it doesn't matter that I'm a youth leader. You're just, you've got Jesus. That's all you need. You know, you're qualified. And she's like, wow. And then go back to the other sister. I'm like, Jesus loves you so much. Now, she's not a Christian yet, but she's like, I love Jesus too. And I was like, ah, oh, I could go and punch a hole in a wall in happiness right now. <laughs> You know, so that was, that was really, really cool. Thank you, Jesus. Um, that was a good Friday night. A girl got healed of a bone disease. Um, and the other youth get to see things like that. They know God's real. 
They know God's love them and they know that Jesus really did what he did and so they know salvation is really at their doorstep. Uh, let's pray. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with all of us. Thank you, Jesus, for your death and resurrection. That you have saved us to an eternal hope. Oh, Lord God, you deserve all the glory and the honor. Lord, we open up our hearts to you right now. We want to receive from you. Would you speak through me? May it be my mouth, but your words, Lord God. Have your way. And thank you for healing us spiritually, soulfully, and physically. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. I want to talk about a culture problem in Australia. Now, every country has culture problems and it has culture strengths, doesn't it? I think Australia has some really good strengths. I also think it has some weaknesses. And I think sometimes both of those can affect the church, maybe a little too much. Sometimes we allow the weaknesses of a culture to, to affect us instead of us affecting the culture. God has made us kings and priests in our nation, amen? That means we ought to lead. That means we ought to know our authority, the authority of Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is our calling as children of God, as ambassadors of the kingdom. We ought to set the temperature when we walk into a room. Has anyone heard of Charles Finney? <laughs> Someone said who? Great man of God in the part of the American revival in the 19th century. He said, if there is a decay of moral conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discernment, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in Christianity, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. The church is responsible. You know, sometimes I used to get upset that Australians don't want to hear the gospel. It's not their fault. It's my fault. It's not to say we don't take the gospel seriously, but sometimes I think our priorities aren't quite in the right order. And I want to talk about some of the priorities when it comes to love, when it comes to Christ's love. And, and the culture problem I want to attack today, not that I want to spend a long time talking about the culture problem, I want to talk about the answer, not just any answer, I want to talk about the living answer, Jesus Christ. That's, that's all we need. The only answer that our society needs for every single problem it has is Jesus Christ enthroned. That's all Australia needs. It needs Jesus. It doesn't need better legislation. It doesn't need better culture. It needs Jesus because he'll bring change to all of that stuff. Culture problem I want to talk about today is one around family. If you're alive, you've probably noticed that there is an attack against the family unit. And we could blame the radical left. But our struggle is not against flesh and blood, amen? It's the doctrine of the devil to destroy families because a stable family glorifies God. And unstable families create unstable children, creates an unstable society. And that's why we really see the problems that we're seeing in the the, uh, the moral decay. It's not because we just want to do the wrong thing. It's because we've got a bunch of unstable thinkers because the devil has attacked our families. And the best way the church ought to glorify God is to prioritize family. Behind Jesus, of course. Okay. Let's turn to Matthew 11. I want to talk about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, I find, was a very profound man. And Jesus has a lot to say about John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 11, verse... Start at verse 10. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you, 
Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yeah, the first time I read that, I thought, he greater than Moses? God used to speak to Moses face to face. Yeah, Jesus says he's greater. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Now, Jesus references the book of Malachi twice there. So we're going to go to Malachi. The first reference is in Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. I want to stop there for now. Elijah. Obviously, the, obviously Malachi doesn't mean Elijah. Elijah has been dead for a long time at this stage. So what's he talking about? He's talking about the same kind of anointing, the same kind of call that the prophet Elijah carried. Now, if you haven't read about Elijah, you can go to 1 Kings chapters 18, 19, 20. That's specifically kind of the meat of uh, Elijah's ministry. What happened? I'm just going to summarize it really quickly. There was a three-year drought. Elijah prayed to God for a drought and there was a drought for three years. And then God said, okay, now it's time to go and talk to King Ahab and let's do some business. So he goes to King Ahab and he says, I want to meet all of your prophets, your, your false prophets, your prophets of Baal and the Ashtoreths on Mount Carmel tomorrow and invite all of Israel to come and watch. And so <laughs> all of Israel comes and watches with one day's warning. <laughs> And, and there's like 800 false prophets there, and there's Elijah by himself. And they have this big showdown. And Elijah says to all the people, Okay, you've been following false gods for a long time now. And our nation is in the condition that it's in because you've been following false gods. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to find out which god is real. So they're going to set up their altar. I'm going to set up mine. We're going to cut up a cow and put it on each. And we're going to call down fire from heaven. And who's ever God answers, that's the real god. And all the people were like, that's fair enough. That's a good idea. I really like it. You can't fake that. So these false prophets went all day and nothing happened. And Elijah's starting to have a go at him. You can sort of start to see his personality come out. He's like, maybe they're on the toilet. Maybe they've gone for a walk. They can't hear you. Get louder. And, you know, this antagonizes them and they're going and, and, and nothing's happening. And Elijah prays. He's like, enough, guys, stop. And he prays to God and he says, reveal yourself to these people. Boom! And the whole nation repented right there and killed all of these prophets. This is a really Old Testament story. You know when the Old Testament gets Old Testament? I tend to think of that chapter right there. But Elijah's call was to bring the nation to repentance. There was a lot of warfare going on spiritually, if, if you want to look into it. The devil doesn't like when people repent. He certainly doesn't like it when you know, people turn back to God or people turn back to each other in love and unity. He hates it because that's his weapon gone. So that was Elijah's call. So someone was going to come before Jesus with the same kind of call to turn God's people back to God. Now, we're still in Malachi chapter 4, so we've just read verse 5. Let's read verse 6. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. Remember how I said a broken family comes in tandem with Moral corruption. If you're going to attack this, you've actually got to look at this too. Because it's the foundation. A shaky foundation equals bad conduct. A good foundation equals a stable life. 
So when we read about John the Baptist, you can probably go there in Matthew 3 and have a, have a squeeze through if you want. And he, t- he says things like, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Don't even begin to say to yourselves, well, we're children of Abraham, we're fine. He said, God can raise children of Abraham out of these rocks. Even now the, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Sort your stuff out. So people are coming to him, what do we do? He's like, you stop doing this, you stop doing this. But there was also a call on his life to restore families or restore the family unit. And look, I've been holding on to this message for like a year now. You've probably heard little snippets come out here and there, but God hasn't let me share it yet because I haven't been ready. But I've been wanting to share this for a long time. I really feel like we're in a John the Baptist season. You know, we've been praying for revival for a long time. We pray for it regularly at our meetings. And, uh, and a lot of us pray for it in private too. And I know we understand that we don't just expect God to do it all. And we do need to partner with God and actually go and do the stuff so that God can come in and do whatever he wants to do. We understand there's a partnership in revival. But I think sometimes God wants to change us so that we can be appropriate vessels as well. Now, he already lives inside us, and we're saved, and we're righteous and holy. But he's also calling us to get our priorities right. Because God determined in this time that someone had to prepare the way and set the stage for Jesus to enter. And Jesus didn't come and lead revival in the surrounding nations. He came to his own people. And then when his job was finished, that's when the Holy Spirit poured out and they went to other nations. We want Jesus to really make himself known. I think there's some things we've got to sort out in ourselves. There's some priorities we've got to get right. And I don't need to talk about moral corruption. We already know what moral corruption is and do this, don't do that. What I want to talk about is the family unit. We are in a John the Baptist season. Honestly, why do you think there's been so much strife in your family? You know that in order for God to deal with something, he's got to bring it up first. That gets messy. God cares about our families. Families glorify Christ. When they all turn to Jesus and they turn to each other, man, that's such a powerful witness. Before I share my testimony, I want to let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 for a second. This is 11 to 17. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. God wants to expose stuff. It's got to come up. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So, I probably should have gone to that verse a couple of minutes ago, but really, I want to say, this is the season we're in. And this is what God seems to be doing in our families. Lots of muck seems to be stirred up at the moment, not just in churches, but just in families. In your biological family, muck seems to be stirred up a lot right now. Because it's time, because there's a family problem, it's it's so common, it's more common for families to break up than to stay together. It's uncommon for me, as a youth leader, to talk to kids whose parents are still together. Man, it messes them up. Families need Jesus. All right. Share my testimony. I grew up in this church. 
It was a nice church. Remember I tried to steal Len's fries wallet out of the back of his pants. Kind of half worked. Remember Punch Rodney over the belt? Did a lot of silly things in this church. I gave my scripture teachers, I mean my Sunday school teachers hell. But it was a great place to be. I love this place. Uh, but there was, and so we're a Christian family, but there wasn't peace in my home. And when I was 10, my parents split up. And you know, I, I didn't know how it affected me at the time, but it came out through my teenage years. One thing I took away from my parents' separation was that because your family is your, your rock, right? It's, it's the expression of God's foundation in your life. And so when they did that, I thought everything in my life is destined to fail. Like every relationship I get into, it's just not going to work. Because that was the example that was in my life. I believed that everything I did was going to fail. You know, so I put my faith in an unstable life. And guess what I received? An unstable life. I mean, it's a no-brainer. That's, that's how I lived my, uh, particularly my teenage years. Everything is destined to fail. I remember when I was in PNG, God gave me a vision, and it was of my family. And they were all sitting around the table together, and they were laughing and enjoying each other's presence. Now, my family have all sat around the table together, and, you know, we've sort of, eh, eh, but we've never had a good bellyache, right? Where we just, I'm just having so much fun and I enjoy being with you people right now. We've never really had that. And God showed me that vision. Uh, but it, it came with a condition. He said, you have to partner with me in this. He wasn't putting all the responsibility on me. It was on him. And I understood that. But he's saying, you've got to partner with me in this. You've got to play a part. And I didn't understand that at the time. Because there was a coldness in my heart towards my family. I didn't love my family. I didn't know how. I didn't understand the concept of loving your family members. My heart was like, it just, it just didn't want to. It, it shut down for, for many years. And uh, I never pursued it. I had never really thought about it again, just like every now and then. And you know, it was maybe about a year later, I'm sweeping the floor at Collier and Miller and I think you've heard this snippet, but never in this context. Uh, you know, I'm like, Lord, I would, I would go and preach the gospel for you, you know, to the nations. I would, you know, do this and that. And God said, how can you reconcile people to my family? And you can't care about your family to see them reconciled. And I was like, okay, I see the logic in that. I don't understand how to care about them. I know I need to, but I, I don't even have a desire to, Lord. I'm like, but I want to have a desire to. So you need to open my heart. And that sort of began my journey to say, Lord, I want to love my family. I want to care about them. And fast forward to 2015, we're at conference in Orange State Conference. And that was a really cool weekend for me. God set me free of a couple of things. and and uh, But there was something going on in me and 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 it was just time for God to just get my heart going and and scholar just felt that he needed to share his testimony with me and it was about him and his family and 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 his life and and he just he came and sat next to me he said Jamie I just feel like I, I need to share this with you and he just started sharing and I'm and I'm listening and and all of a sudden God just went boom and I'm like stop and I have to leave and I left him mid-testimony. He's like, ah! and I, j I just had to get out of there. I didn't know what to do because God just like, it's like he turned the lights on and I was just overcome with how much I felt towards my family. And I'm like, how much I need them, how much I love them, how much God loves them. I was like, I, I don't know how to handle this. And, um, and, and Michael was standing there. He's like, hey man, do you need to talk? I'm like, you're the last person I want to talk to. And God was like, no, no, you don't push him away. You, you need him. And I, so I was like, I grabbed him by the shirt. I was like, come outside. And, um, and then I just sat there and talked to him for about 20 minutes. And he didn't say a word. He just goes, mm, mm, mm. that's all he did. It was the best. And then I was okay. And then he went inside and then I came inside another 10 minutes later. And 
That was really, really good. But that also came with a condition of, of response from me. God wanted me to do something because bear fruit in keeping with repentance. It, it's nice to have a heart change. Good to start walking in it. And God said, you need to go and apologize to your dad. The way you've treated him. I was like, he needs to apologize to me. And he's like, no, no, you need to go and apologize to your dad. And I was like, okay, I get that. And I said, Lord, he's going to throw it back in my face. And God said, what business is that of yours? Who cares? He didn't say who cares. But he said, what business is that of yours? And I went, fair enough. So I went and apologized to my dad. I sat down with him. I, I went over. I sat down with him. I apologized to him for the way I treated him over all the years. And, <laughs> I mean, it didn't go smoothly. He still, I felt like he was throwing it back in my face. But do you know what he was doing? He just had stuff that was weighing on him and it just needed to come out. And that was the opportunity. And I felt like he was throwing it in my face, but God was like, calm down. And I realized afterwards, I'm like, he needed to say those things. He had, he had to get that off his heart. And, um, and, you know, so, and we got to pray together and, oh, best chat. It was so good. And that was the beginning of, I guess, our reconciliation. We'd always been cordial before that. But, yeah. But after that, it started to get really, really healthy. That was uh, something I struggled with over the years, though. Um, not with my dad, but like apologizing to people who you think are going to throw it back in your face. Like I've, I've always struggled with it. I've, I've never really... I've never really understood how to get that right. And, and God's been teaching me about that one over the years. And I, I think that's where a lot of us come unstuck. And that's where I've come unstuck a lot. See, the thing about apologies, it has to be totally unreserved. You have to mean it and apologize for your part and not expect an apology in return. You know how you go in for an apology and you're like, and, and they're going to come clean too. <laughs> that's called coming with strings attached. That is not a real apology. You know what that is? That's being the bigger man, but not obeying Christ. And that's what we do to our family members all the time. I'm going to apologize to you, but you've got to wake up to yourself. All that is, is I, I just want to be justified. Like we think that vindication in the family feud is going to heal us more than Christ's blood. I think if there's anything that has prolonged my sanctification over the years, it's been that I've given half apologies. Like, I'm sorry. Roll back in my face. <laughs> you, know? you know Christ can't be walked on? If, if you actually say, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to apologize to this person. It doesn't matter if they throw it back in your face. It's not about you. You're surrendering to Christ. It should be more so your joy to surrender to Christ than to be justified in this situation. If you want to hang on to that, you're not really changing. You're just looking more holy. And that's not honorable. I can apologize to someone if I know Jesus has justified me and I don't need justification from this person. This person just needs me to love them. Even if they throw it back in my face, they still need me to love them. Anyway. And, uh, you know, out of all of these things, and God has sort of led me over the years as well, like after these events to... to you know, pray for my family here or do this for them there, things like that. And God has still been shaping my heart over all these years. And I mean, I remember one time in worship at Condo Camp a couple of years ago, um, God just brought it up like straight away. He's like, you need to forgive your mum. There's a hardness of your heart towards your mum. You need to forgive your mum. I was like, oh, like I didn't even know about it. But I'm like, hang on a tick, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm like, all right, in the name of Jesus, I forgive my mum. Mum, I forgive you. I release you and, and I love you and I pray that the Lord 
you know, Lord, I pray that you bless her and you, know, you start praying for her. You know, right there, just, just release it. When God brings something up with you, you do it right there. Don't hang on to reasons. We want to hang on to reasons. Let's let go of all the reasons. They're, they're worthless. And uh, so, so God had been working on me over all of these years. And, you know, I'm not always happy with my parents, but, man, they pray for me so much. Oh, my goodness. And, um, and I, I, I have these conversations with Dad a lot still where he prays for my other siblings. And, um, you know, like, the, the split was easiest for me because I, I more so stayed with Christ. But for my siblings, it wasn't so easy. They, they went down some dark paths. And uh, John's heart ended up like kind of colder than mine. He was more affected. And, um, and, and David went his path and my sister went her path and it just you know, brings on a world of hurt to all of them. And, um, but over the years, my, my parents and myself were just, we've been praying for them. And, uh, my brother David comes back to the Lord. He loves Jesus. <laughs> he sometimes gets angry with the church because he's like, you don't love Jesus enough. And, uh, <laughs> there's still work to do in all of us. And, uh, and then I find out my brother John prays to and from work. just spends time with Jesus. I don't know how his faith is doing, but for me to hear that was like, whoa. But even John's starting to talk to us all now and, and call us regularly. Sometimes it's a bit hard to get hold of him, I find out. But, but he talks to us now, like, it was a time where him and my other brother hadn't spoken for 14 years. Same with my sister, same with my mom. Like, you know, it's like he disappeared, but he's like back in the fold now because my dad always persisted and called him and you know, just every now and then as much as John could handle, but also just, just praying for him. And God would encourage dad sometimes. And, and then the last one was my sister. Um, you know, she was part of an abusive marriage and, and she had to get out. And, uh, but it, God gave my dad a word before saying that he would uh, deliver you know, Rebecca. And, and, um, and she come out of that marriage. And she hadn't, because of the nature of the marriage, she was pretty anti-God. Then I'm talking to her on the phone shortly after she got out. And she's like, oh man, God's really looking out for me. And he's provided this for me and that for me. And I was like, whoa. And she said, and you know what the Holy Spirit said to me yesterday? I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> And she goes to an ACC church now. Um, yeah. So it's like, this stuff is all happening. You know, God is doing this in our family. And, he, and he's just been slowly bringing us back together, but also bringing us back to him. And it's really, really amazing. Um, and I'm starting to see this more and more in other people's families. I was talking to someone at the regional pastors gathering uh, the other week and there was some years ago where it's like they had two kids walking with the Lord and two kids without. And I asked them, I'm like, how are your two kids going that are not walking with the Lord? She said, well, wouldn't you believe it? Last November, they both came back to the Lord. You know, and it's like, but these are the themes I'm seeing God do around the place. God is bringing people back to him. And he's bringing people back to each other, families. And he's bringing, them, he's bringing children specifically you know, this is like a real prodigal son coming home kind of season. You know, God is bringing these people back. Ah, God is good. God is so good. I'm going to talk about something else, but I've forgotten. Let's go to 1 Peter. Chapter 2. Ah, back to apologies. I've had a real hard time with apologies. But this one really, like, this one really broke me. You know, Jesus is always my example. He's always our example. Whatever he's done, we can do it. In our strength, no. Because he lives inside us and we expect him to be consistent with who he is. That's why Jesus can't be walked on. One Peter chapter two, start of verse twenty one. But to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself 
the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. You are straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus was getting slapped in the face and insulted. And now he's yelling, come on, prophesy, who hit you? And, and they're calling him all sorts of things. He didn't open his mouth. Not because he was afraid of saying the wrong thing, but because he loved and cared about them more and their salvation more than his vindication. He was prepared to go down if it meant saving them. And if I have any appreciation of that, I ought to let Christ live through me to do that with my family because my love and desire for them to know God and to be reconciled with each other ought to be better than my vindication. You know why God prioritizes family so much? It's where your core will come out. You want to find out how surrendered to Jesus you are? What do you like with your siblings, your parents and your kids? What I don't understand is when people say, I can love people really well who need help. You know, the poor person or this and that. I can love them really well, but I struggle to love my family. You're loving in your own strength. You don't get biblical love. It doesn't make sense to me. How are you going to go and love them if you, if you can't love your family? What happens when this person gets close enough to you wherein you've got to start being vulnerable with them? Guess what? You're not going to be able to love them anymore. I don't want to be kind in my own strength. Thought of finishing off my testimony. Doing pastoral care the last couple of years. I'm not a pastoral care guy. But it's the best now. Uh, God's really changed my heart like that. Do you know something I've hated my entire life? Phone calls. Hate them. Just talk to me in person or text. Don't call me. But you know, that wasn't just a weakness in my life because I hated phone calls. It stopped me from calling my family because I hated phone calls. My mum would get really frustrated with me because I'd call her on Mother's Day, or birthday, special occasions. I wouldn't just call her. I'm like, I hate phone calls. You know, but I wasn't just like that with my mum. I was like that with my whole family. The only reason I've got a good relationship with my family is because they called me. I didn't call them. I was... I was a terrible family member. And uh, I, remember, I remember when God changed my heart to phone calls, and I was like, whoa, I really enjoy this now. That was fantastic. God can change you. He really can change you. You're not stuck in your ways. There's no such thing. And just surrender to Jesus, seriously. And uh, yeah, but I've always been terrible contact with my family, always. And I remember God said to me last year, he said, you need to call every single one of your family members every two weeks. And that was like, whoa. I can talk to you once every six months. And I think we've got a good relationship. <laughs> and so I set an alarm on my phone. And I, you know, like, go into my calendar and I'd, I'd put all these things in. And it's like, I'm going to call every member of my family every two weeks. I didn't. I did it like every three weeks, every four weeks. But still for me, that was a miracle. That you know when I did that, when I just started calling my family regularly, my anointing and ministry skyrocketed. And I wasn't doing anything else differently. I wasn't pastorally caring for people better. I didn't have mad revelations or anything. I was just calling my family regularly. I was prioritizing love towards the people that God put in my life. I'm not just trying to be kind to people that need kindness. I'm learning to become a good steward of what God has given me. You know, you can't fake anointing. You can't cheat the Holy Spirit. You can't ride a glory wave forever. It doesn't work. There's no shortcut to holiness Love has priorities. It starts with Jesus' love for you. Because we love him because he first loved us. Amen. 
But then the first people that goes to is your family because they're the ones you will be most vulnerable to. That's the way it works. And if God transforms you in that way, where you get it right because Jesus is just flowing through you, you will love your church well. You will love the unsaved well. You will love the poor and needy well. And there's going to be an anointing with it. When we get the priorities of love wrong, we're doing something that the Bible talks about in the Old Testament where you know God says, leave the trimmings of your farm for the people that need food. You know, when we prioritize love wrong, we're getting trimmings, but we're not getting the harvest. There's still a grace there that God provides. You know, and, and so we see some fruit, but it's nothing compared to what it could be. Because we'd like to be kind, but justified in our own pride instead of surrendered to Jesus, saying, Lord, have your way in me. You really want to be surrendered to Jesus. What do you think about your family? You know, that'll be a real testing ground for you. And, you know, I could be talking to young people. You know, what do you think about your parents in particular? Do you blame them for the way that they treated you? Do you blame them for anything? As long as you blame them for something, you don't have a reason to change. But I'm also talking to parents now as well. I know you love your kids. I know you pray for your kids. But what do you think about your parents? And I guarantee you, whatever you think about your parents, it will come through into your kids. Your kids are going to receive it. And you may not even know about it. What's in the heart comes out the mouth. What do you think about your siblings? Do you still hang on to that thing that happened 20 years ago? Like it's, it's time to die to ourselves. It's time to let it go. It's time to put it right. We go to the Psalms. I'm going to read Psalm 133. And read the whole chapter. Three verses. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Like precious oil on the head, running down the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down the collar of his robes. Like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded his blessing. Life forevermore. I don't want the devil to destroy our families. I want to glorify God with healthy families. I want to set a stage for Christ. You know, the world will know you when you have love for one another. The world will recognize you as God's, as Jesus' disciples when you have love for one another. It says that in John 13, 34 to 35. The reason you get most tested in your family, on your surrender to Christ, is because we we tend to find out that's you know, where our false expectations are. You know, you put your sibling or your parent or your kids on it. And we, we set an expectation on them and then they don't fulfill it and then we get disappointed with them and then we get angry with them and we react. Expectations don't really come out when you know someone's in need. But when you think someone ought to love you better and they don't, and that stuff will come out. You know, and then we want to demand our pound of flesh, not knowing that Jesus provided his for me, which we partook in earlier. Repentance of a nation is preceded by people putting their house in order. Specifically, when the church puts its house in order. I, st I still believe in revival. 100%. I think it's closer than it ever has been. But I think we ought to do more than pray and even just go out and share the word. 
I think we ought to say, Lord, where do you need to change me, particularly in regards to those that you have placed in my life? How can I, I, I need to repent of all the expectations I have on them and I need you to love them through me and I don't want to seek to justify myself anymore. I don't want to put it over them anymore. I don't want to hang on to stuff they did anymore. I need to forgive. Yeah, that's when Jesus really shows up. I think we should pray. And uh, I really feel like it's time to let go of some things. Sometimes we let those we love hold us back because we wished they didn't do something to us. Oh, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ and that you work in us what Jesus has accomplished. Lord, we pray for eyes to be opened right now. Spiritual darkness be gone in the name of Jesus. Chains be broken in the name of Jesus. Lord, reveal to us, each of us, where we need to let go. Where we need to forgive. Where we need to surrender to. Us. Humble us. I think we should all pray. I mean, if there's nobody you need to forgive, maybe you don't need to pray this, but be open. You know, the good thing about forgiveness is you don't need to feel like forgiving. Sometimes we think we can't forgive. We just say, I just can't forgive. That's not true. We just don't want to. Because we think it's going to set us free, but Jesus set you free. I think forgiveness is like doing the dishes. I don't want to do the dishes, but I do it anyway. When you decide to do something, your emotions will follow after that. The same as salvation. You believe it in your heart, you confess it. Mind renewal comes afterwards. Not before. Now let's decide to forgive. There's no identity in that offense for you. It's vanity. It's idolatry. Not worth keeping. Pray after me if you feel like, or you can pray with your own words. You can say the name quietly or the names. The name of Jesus. Lord, I forgive. I release them to you. Sorry for hanging on to what they need. When you've forgiven them, you've forgiven me. You live in me. Lord, I commit them into your hands. Pray you encourage them. Speak to them. Help them. Love them. Glorify your name in their life. Lord, I wish their best. 
and I know that you are the first. I don't need to be justified by their acknowledgement. I just need yours, Lord. Thank you that you have set me free and it's by your stripes that I'm healed. Not by me beating anybody. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. The Lord of my family. Lord, I lift up every person here and I say, bring their children home. Bring our children home, Lord God. Every son and daughter that has walked away from you. Oh, bring them back in Jesus' name. May every chain on their lives be broken. Bring your deliverance, Lord God. Set them free in Jesus' name. Reveal yourself to them. Everything that is tied into their lives, we break it now in Jesus' name. We thank you that you are returning your children. That this is the season where they come home. Lord, overcome us with your love. Reconcile us with our parents and our children and our siblings. Whatever you need us to do, may we do it. May we not give a half apology. May we be unreserved and that it would be such a joy for us to surrender to you. You're all that matters, Jesus. You're all that matters and we want you to be glorified in our families. Bring us back together. May we shine to the rest of this nation. Show them that the family unit is given by God. We declare your reconciliation. Lord, may miracles occur. People that haven't spoken to each other for 10, 20 years, there are phone calls coming. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Things that have been buried for many years that have been unapproachable and that have been glossed over. May they be released. Jesus, you have given us a clean slate and you have destroyed all hostility between people by dying on the cross. Thank you for your work. Lord, continue to lead us in this. May this not be just something that we've done today. May we bear fruit in keeping with repentance. May our heart's desire be from this moment, Lord, to obey you, know your love, transforms us individually brings our families back together however you want us to love our family members Lord would you give us wisdom in doing so yes Lord we thank you we thank you Jesus.